Okay, so now we're back to talk about um, some key theoretical views on humans' relationships to the environment. So these key views are two different um, of what we would call epistemological positions, the realist position and the constructivist position. So uh, if you haven't come across this term before, epistemology is essentially the study of knowledge, the study of how we know what we know. And so you can think of epistemological positions as kind of standpoints on the the nature of knowledge. And I know that sounds really, really abstract, and I think it'll make a bit more sense as I talk about them, these two positions, in a slightly more grounded way. So a realist position uh, views environmental problems as things that can be known and seen and revealed to us by science. Um, and so the realist position essentially holds that there is a kind of real world out there and to understand the the nature of the world we must you know conduct experiments and that that is the kind of you know reality is what we can be what we can glean through interacting with the material world and conducting research on it whereas the constructivist position um is more interested in in how how knowledge about environmental issues is socially produced. So um, the constructivist position kind of exists um, on a bit of a, a spectrum. So there's a weak constructivist position that holds that, yes, of course, um, the, the things around us are, are kind of real and scientifically discernible, but they can only be understood through the lens of our social and cultural um, development and so you know just as we were talking about um the ways that you know scientists themselves are humans they are they are um not immune from their own biases and assumptions uh that would be you know that would be a kind of constructivist vision of science and the scientist because we're trying to look at not only you know these material realities that we can discern but we're trying we're trying to look at how we understand them and the values that we place on them. So that's the kind of the crux of these two different positions. Um, so an example that I could give you on how these different positions might inform our approach to things would be um, an example of uh, the the miscategorization of um, of skeletons that have been discovered in archaeological dig sites. So this is um, skeletons of people from a very, very long time ago. Um, it was found relatively recently that some skeletons have been misclassified as um, as being female when they're actually, uh, being male when they're actually female or female when they're actually male um, due to how they were buried. So when skeletons were found buried with um, with the kind of trappings of a warrior, uh, like a you know a dagger or a spear or things like that, um, they have been classified erroneously as as being male when they were actually female, through which was found through the kind of carbon testing of the bones. And um, the another example of that is um, one skeleton being um, kind of misidentified as female when two skeletons were found kind of the people were obviously buried together they looked like they were hugging the skeletons have been called the lovers and it was more recently um, identified that these skeletons were both male so there was an assumption that this was a, um, a heterosexual couple who were buried together and that was not actually true so these assumptions about um, you know who is buried together and who is buried with weapons um, have very clearly kind of coloured scientists' views of um, of what they're seeing. So this would be a constructivist view would be trying to understand why would scientists just have assumed or have inferred rather that this is a a male skeleton when you know, carbon testing found that it was actually female. Why did they make that assumption? And we can look at our social understandings about gender and gender roles. And that is, again, looking at social factors and looking at how 
the world around us is socially produced and how we lay a cultural meaning onto material realities. So again, um, hopefully that kind of clarifies those two positions. So um, essentially for in the realist position, environmental problems are revealed to us by science and they are problems for humans and other species. And the, the kind of ethical question emerges of how do we respond to these things? How do we address them? That's kind of the, the dilemma that emerges from this type of perspective. Whereas in contrast to this constructivist perspective, some they're highlighting how environmental knowledge is socially produced and how to some extent all environmental problems are constructed by humans, how you know, some problems are seen as more important than others, how some problems are seen as problems only because they impact negatively on humans. So um, the constructivist approach essentially investigates why some environmental issues are seen to be less important than others, um, why some issues are important and some are ignored, why some are constructed as being very meaningful. Um, and it, this approach also considers the way that um, the way that the kind of understanding of um, of environmental issues may not be a kind of direct reflection of reality. So the environmental issues that we're worried about may not necessarily be those that are the greatest um, threat to us. So um, we can see that, for instance, in prior to the um, the most recent bushfires, there was not really much kind of priority put on preventing bushfires. There was funding removed from um, the, the kind of fire fighting agencies, and there was a lot of priority put on you know, uh, things like um, access to to sites to mine certain materials. So or um, you know, maybe trying to find like more environmentally responsible ways to mine or trying to figure out carbon capture technology. Um, so, you know, I think you can see from those particular examples that it's not necessarily that we collectively decide or our representatives such as the government decide like, yes, this is the most pressing issue because it poses the greatest risk to the environment or to human life or whatever metric you'd like to use and then they act on it um it is instead that we we view certain issues as as more pressing or kind of more more concerning than others um so according to giddens the the kind of premise of a constructivist approach is the idea that nature cannot speak for itself and humans therefore kind of speak on its behalf so he argues that because of this, um, environmental problems are, or all environmental problems are essentially constructed by people because they're all you know, identified and articulated by people. That's how they become an environmental problem as such. Um, so this is kind of a, a bit of a tree falling in the woods type of argument. Is it an environmental problem if it's not identified as such? And a constructivist approach would argue no. Something is only an identified environmental problem once we identify it as an environmental problem. So um, a constructivist analysis would be looking at what is the history of this problem, who is making the claim of crisis, which can tell us a lot about you know, crisis for whom, what impact may it have, why is it viewed as important, um, what evidence is presented and how. So I think we all know that um, while while we have like really good quality evidence about certain things, um, statistics and forms of evidence can be presented in ways that favor one viewpoint over another. So it's important in a constructivist analysis to be critical about how evidence is presented, what evidence is presented. Um, and then finally, what other views exist and what do they say about the issue? Um, so if, after going through those questions, a um, environmental sociologist undertaking a constructivist analysis would then question whether the um, the issue should still be considered a crisis, and if so, they would 
determine some suitable actions, make some recommendations about what should be done. So in, um, in contrast to this, the realist approach argues that environmental problems can be understood objectively. So they have a single objective reality, they are real, and they exist outside of human consciousness, outside of human awareness. So a realist perspective would argue that environmental problems do not only become environmental problems when they are constituted as such by humans, they are inherently environmental problems that humans then discover or don't discover. And so realists search for causal explanations. They search for you know, what caused this problem and like who is responsible, what is responsible. And they try to prepare, try to explore and debate the, the kind of natural science of environmental issues. So they're more concerned about the science behind things, whereas constructivists are concerned about um, the the way that these issues are socially understood or are you know, socially turned into problems, why we think they're problems. And um, for a realist kind of perspective to understand an environmental problem properly and put places, put um, measures into place to prevent it or to, um, you know, to, to do something about it, one first needs to understand the scientific facts. So a realist perspective is very much based on understanding the, the kind of facts of the issue, but is much less concerned with understanding you know, what kinds of you know, social and cultural ideas have shaped our understandings of these facts and you know, have shaped our view of this as something that is an actual issue or, or a threat. So um, for an example, if we're looking at a, um, a kind of realist perspective on, um, on a particular environmental issue, we can use the example of mad cow disease. So um, I know that many of you have, um, have probably heard of mad cow disease, but some of you may not have. Um, essentially, uh, mad cow disease is a a kind of um, a, a disease that affects cattle and it came about in the um, it was the 80s in the UK and so basically um, as part of the kind of post-World War II intensification of agriculture in the UK uh, it was kind of an effort to ensure that um, the UK could feed all of its citizens that they would never have rationing again that no one would go hungry and so there was pressure to produce kind of more food from less land and less resources. So um, there was a push to uh, find more intensive and cost-effective ways for, of farming. And so part of this was, um, was that uh, parts of, of cows that were kind of sent to slaughter that were not then kind of packed off and... Um, sold to humans or used for, for other products and such were um, broken down and then fed to two cows that were also being raised in the in the same place to be you know, used for um, for beef as a way of putting more protein into the cow's diets and um, the farmers and the kind of agricultural industry at this time didn't realize that um, this is kind of bad um they didn't realize that essentially um consuming the the kind of brain matter of the same species is is um is kind of bad for the health or can you know give diseases to certain types of animals including humans we we can get sick from eating human brains we know this from um from uh, uh groups of uh humans that have been cannibals um so don't do that, bad idea. Uh, so essentially, um, I, I'm telling you all this because mad cow disease is the, the kind of disease that cows had that came from this intensive type of farming. It was a new disease that hadn't really been seen before. Farmers noticed that their cattle were getting kind of neurological issues. Their legs were really weak. It was called mad cow disease because the cows acted very strangely. Um, and so when this first happened, no one had any idea what caused this outbreak. It was really concerning. Um, but 
there was no kind of good information that um, that suggested that eating these cows would be a threat to human health. And so these cows were sold to the UK public. They were you know, butchered and exported overseas. And it didn't kind of come along or like knowledge didn't kind of come about until much later on that um, that that told us that the the uh, mad cow disease could kind of make the species link and that in eating infected um, beef could infect um, humans with a, a kind of human variant of mad cow disease. And so, you know, essentially um, the UK government was quite kind of slow to act on, on this particular issue. And a lot of their citizens, not a lot, but a significant number of their, their citizens kind of got, got sick from this. Um, so if you'd like to know more about uh, mad cow disease and the kind of mad cow disease outbreak in the UK, um, I, I do recommend have a look into it. It's a really interesting and alarming case of, um, of what can come about through intensive forms of um, agriculture and animal rearing, intensive farming. Um, it's also a classic case study in what not to do in risk communication is essentially the UK government um, found out that that mad cow disease could affect humans and then didn't quite know what to do and didn't tell the public immediately and the public later found this out through the release of, um, of internal government documents and it really really eroded public trust in the government which has probably not entirely recovered even to this day. So um, anyway, returning to the kind of issue at hand here, um, using a realist approach to mad cow disease, social scientists would ask, what kind of creatures are cows? What are their um, capacities? So you know, we'd be looking at like, what is, you know, if we're looking at cows, like, do they have some of the same kind of issues as other mammals? Is this something we've seen before? Is this something that has infected cows in other countries? We'd be looking at the cow itself. Um, we'd also be looking at whether there's something in the biology of humans that would make them react to this disease. We'd be looking at, is there any evidence that there can be a kind of species jump um, of this condition? Um, we'd be looking at how the food production system operates and what political and economic decisions were made that allowed dead cows to be fed to other cows. Um, and, you know, we'd be trying to understand how did this come about? When was this practice allowed? And were there enough safeguards in place? Was this actually a, a decision that was informed by enough information for us to be making a decision that this is an appropriate thing to do? When we're talking about our, our food supply and then finally why do people in the UK eat so much beef? So these are the kind of realist questions um, that could be asked about this issue, they're questions that can be scientifically measured, they're questions of material reality and um, then on the flip side of this if we're thinking about what are some constructivist questions that would be asked about this kind of episode in the UK's history we would be asking questions about, for instance, why did people continue to eat beef when there were questions about whether the um, mad cow disease could affect humans? Why did people think that that was an acceptable risk? Um, we could be asking questions about the government and their kind of prioritization of certain things, whether their, um, their desire to protect the um, UK beef export industry and domestic industry overshadowed their concern about the potential health implications. Um, you know, so we're asking more kind of sociological or more kind of um, more questions about the role of social norms and priorities rather than questions of material reality that is scientifically measurable. So um, when we're looking at realist responses, uh, we can divide the kind of realist responses to environmental issues into two main kind of categories. So first up, there's reformist, which um, is you know, a response that uses small um, reforms to the existing economic and political structures. Um, 
So these kinds of responses don't make huge kind of systematic changes. They kind of they use often technology as a solution to, uh, that allows our kind of existing system to continue operating. So um, uh, any kind of kind of carbon offset, biobanking offset, like anything that's offsetting our our um our behavior that has a negative environmental impact is a good example of a reformist type of policy. Um, the creation of electric vehicles or perhaps um, any kind of policy that mandated that um you know only electric vehicles from 2030, for instance, is um is reformist in that it's operating within our existing system, but kind of switching things out. It's not saying to people, don't drive a personal car. It's saying to them, fuel your car differently. And um, then the second perspective on kind of, or second um, approach to environmental problems from the realist perspective is, um, is radical. So this would be a an approach that dictates or you know argues for an overhaul um, and argues for uh, you know an alignment with ecological Marxist principles and um, this is something that is addressed in the reading for this week so if you're interested in these ideas um, you take a look at that um, but essentially this would be, rather than tinkering with aspects of our existing system and way of doing things, this would be overhauling the system. This is the, the kind of revolution um, option. And so um, although we can use the, the kind of realist and social constructivist perspectives to help us to see environmental problems differently, each from a sociological perspective, but with different approaches to knowledge, it's important to keep in mind that um, that neither of these perspectives is terribly useful if they're taken alone. So um, Ulrich Beck, who I'll speak about um, a bit more about um, in, in the next section of this lecture, tries to combine these approaches into a kind of, you know, a, a weak constructivist position in which he's trying to bring a, a realist and constructivist approach together to understand the the material world and so, and um you know natural ecological problems as things that exist out there in the world but are shaped by our cultural understandings of them. So um he would kind of try to use both of these approaches to to answer different questions and bring different perspectives, which is um. You know, what I would generally recommend doing to avoid viewing environmental problems purely as the result of ecological forces or purely as the result of a kind of you know, social hysteria that's completely overblown or you know, social and cultural biases, for instance. So I'm going to leave this here now and then I'll come back for the final part of the lecture in which I'm going to talk to you about some, some theorists of environmental sociology.